India can parallel Africa's big five animal for animal. Africa has its big cats, lion and leopard, and so does India, though India's lions are confined to just one park. Actually, when it comes to big cats, India has the biggest in the tiger. Point to India. The mega herbivores are also matches. African elephant to Asian, Cape and Asiatic buffalo, and Africa's rhinos mirror to the Indian rhino. The big difference is the big five can be found in many African parks, while no Indian park has more than two, except in one small state at the extreme edge of India. And in that state of Assam, there is one great park where all three of the giants can be found as well as the leopard and tiger. Join us today as we explore Kazaringa National Park, land of the giants. Namaste, I'm Bill Ball, and I'm going to be your guide on this episode of Journeys in India. And this is India. Kazaringa National Park was established in 1968, though the area has been protected since the early 1900s. Today it is home to one of the last populations of the Indian or one-horned rhino, wild water buffalo, and Asiatic elephant. These are big animals that need large territories and huge areas for grazing to survive. That is available here in the state of Assam. Assam is located in the far, and I do mean far, eastern India, in that spit of land that extends into a peninsula like a finger. It is a culturally, ethnically, and linguistically distinct area. To reach Kazaringa National Park, you have to fly into the nearest major airport in the city of Guwahati, then hop aboard a van or car, and then drive between four and six hours, depending on the park gate that you're staying near. It isn't easy to get to Kazaringa, but that's why it is as wild as it is. Today we're going to explore Kazaringa National Park and look for the big three. The elephant, the one-horned rhino, and the Asiatic wild buffalo. Also, we're going to learn a little bit about the British era and a bit about the locals too. Kazaringa gets its name from a couple of potential sources. Legendarily, it comes from two young lovers from opposing local tribes, a boy named Kazi and a girl named Ranga, who fell in love, but their romance was forbidden by their families, so they fled into the forest together, never to return. On the other hand, historians believe it comes from the Karbi word, Kajir Arang, which means a village of Kajir, a common feminine name from a time when a female may have ruled this area. Now, I like to believe the romantic story, but you can pick for yourself. The park is a moist, almost swampy mix of savanna and forest. The abundance of rivers and marshlands makes it a perfect habitat for our big three, the rhino, water buffalo, and elephant. Along with these megafauna, the park supports 35 species of mammals and over 500 species of birds. In fact, the area surrounding Kazaringa has become a magnet for birders seeking out rare Asian birds. The park has four gates. Each is between a half hour to an hour apart. This is a huge park measuring some 166 square miles or about the size of a large city. Within each gate there are miles of dirt roads ideally laid out for jeeps to get as close to areas where wildlife congregates. And this park keeps track of their megafauna doing census work on a yearly basis. These are animals that poachers literally aim for, and protection is job one. The numbers for the park are impressive, with over 1,800 rhinos, 1,400 water buffalo, and 1,250 elephants. That translates into 12,000 tons of wildlife in just those three species. That is a lot of weight for a park to support, even a park as large as Kazaringa. We have time for two drives and an elephant safari. With a little luck, we should be able to see all of the big three, 
Rhino, Buffalo and Elephant, and some of the other game that the park is famous for. These big three are potentially dangerous, so we will have to be alert for any signs of aggression. If we stay in our Jeeps, we should be fine. But people on foot have been killed by each of these magnificent creatures. As long as you listen to the local drivers and rangers, you'll be safe. But as an added precaution, here, different from other parks in India, the rangers that ride with you carry guns. It's time for our first Jeep Safari and I'm bubbling over with excitement. Kazaringa has the world's largest population of one-horned rhinos, one of the larger populations of wild Asiatic elephants, and it is probably the best, and unfortunately, one of the only places where you can find wild water buffalo. In fact, there is no other place on earth where all three can be seen in any sizable numbers. It doesn't take long before we spot the park's signature animal, the one-horned rhino. Of the big three, it is the rhino that is the symbol of not only the park, but Assam wildlife in general. Rhinoceros have been poached worldwide for their horn for use as a male enhancement drug and as a decorative dagger handle. Of course, there is no truth that the horn has any medicinal value. It's the same material as your fingernails. So, in that theory, chewing your fingernails would, well, you get my point. Let's talk numbers for a minute. There are over 1,800 rhinos. Though that is a good population for this park, it is still vulnerable. A few years ago, major flooding in the park killed many of that year's young, and some adults as well. Rangers also told me that last year, over 100 rhinos were poached even under the strict protective measures. Any funding reductions for guards and poaching could easily get out of control. Unlike their African cousins, which prefer dry to arid conditions, this one-horned rhino is a wetlands creature. Not only do they get their feet wet, they can often be found wading deep into ponds, eating the plants that thrive there. Another big difference between the one-horned rhino and the African species is just that, one horn, while the African rhinos have two. The one thing I've always reminded myself of is that once I leave this rhino haven, I won't see another one until I return here or one of the other few parks with sustainable populations. Once found throughout the Indian subcontinent, they are now restricted to a few parks in India, Nepal, and Bhutan. Worldwide population hovers around 2,400. Ironically, of the three Asian rhino species, the Indian or one-horned rhino is king in numbers. There are so few Javan or Sumatran rhinos that wild sightings are almost non-existent. Captive breeding populations of one-horned rhinos are small, so the only long-term solution to preserve this ancient creature probably little change since the Ice Age, is saving its natural habitat. And the best in the world is Kazaringa. Not surprisingly, it is also the best place to preserve another rare and vulnerable species, the wild water buffalo. This member of the big three rivals the rhino in size, weighing in at a whopping 2,600 pounds. More impressive than its weight is the size of its horns. The distance between each end of the horns can reach four feet. And unlike the rhino's horn, which is not really a horn, these are real horns. A horn, by definition, is a bony material on the outside with living tissue on the inside. So they are permanent and can grow throughout the animal's lifetime. In contrast, Members of the deer family, which include deer, elk, moose, and caribou, have antlers, which are shed each year. Antlers have the living tissue on the outside, at least during the antler's growth period, and the bony material on the inside, a reversal of a horn. Water buffaloes are herd animals and can travel in groups of upwards to 30. Large numbers mean more eyes and ears to detect predators. Here in India, there is really only one predator's buffalo fear, the tiger. 
And even then, a large herd of adult buffalo are more than the big cat would want to tackle. So that leaves just one threat. Man. People captured water buffalo centuries ago for domestication, but that was only the beginning of the problems for the wild buffalo. Even though Hindus, the vast majority of India, do not believe in eating cows, there is often a distinction made allowing buffalo consumption. Also, domestic stock can mingle with or near wild animals, either diluting the gene pool or infecting them with cattle diseases they wouldn't get otherwise. There are a couple of key physical differences between the wild and the domestic water buffalo. One is size. The wild variety is bigger than the domestic by a large margin. The other physical difference is the horns. Domestic stock have small, curved horns, while the wild ones have broad, open-pointed horns for fighting. And that brings me to the last and most important difference, attitude. Domestic buffalo have no attitude. They are easily herded, but the wild buffalo is another story. They are the most unpredictable of the big three, a trait they share with their African cousins, the Cape Buffalo. Similar in general appearance, the horns of the water buffalo are larger to match their bigger size. Water buffalo outweigh Cape Buffalo by nearly half a ton. Cape Buffalo have never been domesticated and are much more common today in the wild than their Asian counterparts. In fact, the Asiatic or water buffalo are found in only two small pockets in the far eastern and central India. The largest population is here in Kazaringa and represent the vast majority left in India. It is Kazaringa's marshy savanna that allows water buffalo to thrive here and gives us a chance to experience the much bigger, more majestic and totally untamed wild ancestor of the common buffalo. To me, these are the only buffalo in Asia. The rest are just cattle. We had been in the park less than an hour and we could check two of the big three off. The harder to find and less common Asiatic elephant was all that we had left. But there is much more to Kazaringa than just the giants. Hog deer, a less common cousin of the chittle, are found here. Hog deer lack the distinctive spots and large antlers of the slightly larger chittle or spotted deer. The big difference between the two is hog deer prefer tall grasslands and swamps while spotted deer like dry forest. Spotted deer have a huge distribution through India while hog deer are found in a very limited area along the northern and eastern border. Hog deer get their odd name because they have short legs and a stout rump giving it a pig-like appearance. Though abundant in Kazaringa, its overall numbers are on the decline. Of course, the big threat to its survival aren't tigers or crocodiles, but man, habitat destruction is probably the biggest problem. The grassy wetlands that are the haunt of the hog deer also make good cropland when drained. As national parks are becoming isolated islands of green, the deer are finding less and less suitable habitat. Add to the loss of habitat poaching and you have a one-two punch. As we leave the diminutive deer behind, we soon come across the first good bird sighting, the lesser adjunct. These members of the stork family are obviously the ones that bring the ugly babies. As with many species in India, and particularly here in Kazaringa, they are closely related to the African species, the more famous and common marabou stork. This family of storks are scavengers and have no feathers on their head to prevent bacteria from the carcasses they feed on infecting them. A little further on, we spot a second stork species, the black neck stork. One interesting piece of stork trivia, storks are the only bird family that lacks a voice box. Maybe that's how they can sneak in and drop off a baby undetected. As we start to head out of the park, we catch sight of another park resident, the wild pig. This ancestor of the domestic pig has a much darker coat here in the east 
than in the northern or central India. We make our way out of the park as the sun sets, feeling pretty good. We got two of the big three we were after in our first drive, as well as the rare adjunct stork, hog deer, and wild pig. We have an elephant safari in the morning and one last drive tomorrow afternoon, so I feel confident the big three are within reach. A good night's rest goes a long way to preparing for an elephant safari. Some of the crew have never ridden on an elephant, so this should be interesting. Riding an elephant is more of an art than a science. You have to feel the motion of the elephant and go with it, much as a dancer feels the music and moves to it. The hardest hit will be the cameraman. There is no easy way to get good moving pictures on the back of an elephant. On the other hand, photo cameras, especially digital cameras, can get pretty good shots off of an elephant. The purpose in going on an elephant is to get closer to the wildlife. The elephant can leave the road, head directly into the marsh. Also, animals tend to be less frightened by an elephant than a motor vehicle. The first wildlife we spot are hog deer. The idea that animals are calmer with elephants proves true as the deer don't flee quite as quickly as they did yesterday. Our hope is that the elephants will draw out their compadres and will get the big three completed this morning. A gray animal is ahead. This could be our elephant. Oh, no, not to be. Just another rhino. Now, that does sound weird to say, just another. Yet, seeing rhinos at Kazaringa is very easy. That wasn't always the case as the numbers have only come back since being made a national park. In fact, the diversity of wildlife and especially the protection of the big three has earned Kazaringa the UNESCO, United Nations, Education, Science, and Cultural Organizations World Heritage Status. This puts it at the same category of importance as the Serengeti, the Great Barrier Reef, and Yellowstone. With a little practice, the cameraman has learned to shoot reasonably well from the back of an elephant and has captured a hard-to-get animal, even from a steady jeep. It's a bird, and not just any bird. It's an Indian roller. This is one of the most beautiful birds in the world. Its name comes from the fact that it rolls in the air as it catches insects. We spot some bigger game ahead. It's more buffalo. We seem to be in the buffalo rhino zone. Our elephant safari hasn't yielded us our last big three sighting, their own wild brethren. With time off between our last safari and the late afternoon, it's time to learn a little bit about the true economic secret of Assam and do a little stretching in the process. The Kazaringa area, of course, is famous for its wildlife, but the real economic engine here isn't the wildlife, but it's these, tea leaves. You know when they say all the tea in China? They should be saying all the tea in India. Assam tea is black tea that is grown at or near sea level. It is known for its body, malty flavor, and strong bright color. It is often called a breakfast tea. Assam is second only to South China in the production of tea, and those two areas are the only ones in the world with native wild tea species. It is thought that the Boros people were the first settlers in Assam and they brought tea and rice with them from the east. The Assam tea was rediscovered by Robert Bruce in 1823, growing wild. When Britain lost the tea monopoly in China, they quickly turned to Assam and crossbred the local wild tea with Chinese varieties. Today, tea production is still a big employer, accounting for 17% of Assam's jobs. Assam produces over half of all of the tea produced in India, and with the most being sold at auction in the airport city of Guwahati. The local villages around Assam tea plantations are even more dependent on tea than the state as a whole. Virtually all the employment for this village comes from tea. Picking it, working in the processing factory, or serving in some way those that work in tea. 
Though villages are starting to modernize, they are fascinating side trips when visiting the park. They add a cultural and human side to the experience. With the help of a local guide or your hotel, they can direct you to a village where you can learn about the local customs and lifestyle. The tea connection in Assam hits home with us as our hotel has a direct tie to the colonial era. Our Heritage Lodge is located near the least used fourth gate. The most crowded gate is the second, where there are many hotels. The fourth gate has few visitors. Not that there aren't a lot of tourists anywhere in Kazaringa, but here you really feel like you're alone in the wilderness. Our hotel is the Kolobor Manor. It used to be a manor house for a tea plantation manager. After years of neglect, it has been lovingly restored into a boutique hotel. With a total of only four rooms, you will never feel like you're in a typical lodge. Each room is spacious and has its own in-suite facilities. The rooms were the manager's suite, the manager's wife's room, the children's room, and a guest room that has been modernized while still retaining its plantation feel. Colabor Tea Plantation was owned by Williamson and Magar, which today is run by the fourth generation under the name Williamson Tea Assam. This tea company has 17 tea establishments producing 21 tons of tea annually. Colabor was one of the biggest tea plantations at its founding in 1925, stretching over nine miles. In 2006, the manager's bungalow was bought by a local Assam businessman and his Swedish partner who turned it into this lodge. Since purchasing the property, they have attempted to track down and buy original furnishings to add a bit more historical flair. Learning the connection between our lodge and tea production got me interested in learning more about the British lifestyle during the peak colonial tea era. There is no better place than to start at the former Colonial Sports Club facility. Originally reserved for the British, no Indians allowed, it is now open to all locals who would like to use the facilities. The British were experts at bringing a little bit of home with them wherever they went in the world. And here in tea country, it was no exception. Not only did they bring the food and drinks that they liked, but they also brought with them their sporting events. And boy, what sports they brought with them. In a field now used for cattle, they played golf. They built a full-size polo field just beyond. There was also a snooker table, library, full bar, and a dance floor, all aimed at enjoying the spoils of a colonial lifestyle. They thought of everything, even imported a piano. The club is not quite at the level it once was when the tea barons and plantation managers live the life. There was a time when the club even had a private landing strip for those tea men that had quite a distance to travel. During World War II, this was a place of respite for American servicemen as well. If you can just close your eyes, you can still hear the music and laughter of an era long gone. With Colonial Assam still fresh in my mind, it was time to begin our third and last safari with the clear target to get at least one wild elephant on film. Not surprisingly, the first big animal we spot is a rhino. With over two-thirds of the world's one-horned rhino population within its borders, Kazaringa is the future for rhino relocation. In fact, Kazaringa rhinos were recently released into another UNESCO World Heritage Park in Assam, Manus, to create another population in case a catastrophe should hit Kazaringa. We head off on a different route, this time to the Brahmapta River that supplies the vast majority of water to the park. Climbing an observation tower to survey the river might just give us our first elephant sighting. According to our local ranger guide, the elephants often visit the river, so this would be a great place to start. We see a lot of movement on a distant island. This time though, it's a herd of swamp deer. This is another rare animal centered in Kazaringa. With an estimated population of 468, the vast majority of swamp deer in the northeast are here. 
The only other population is the hard ground race found in central India and only in Kana National Park. Though they are far away, their rarity make this a very satisfying sighting. With no elephants in the river, it's time to head into the bush. A rustle in the trees and we have our second rare bird sighting. It's the largest member of the hornbill family, the great hornbill. With a wingspan that tops five feet, you can see how it earned its name. We haven't forgotten about the predators of the park. In fact, Kazaringa has the highest density of tigers anywhere in the world, with one tiger for every two square miles. The park hosts about 88 tigers, and these claw marks in the tree tell me that we've entered one of their territories. Even so, if you see a tiger in Kazaringa, you are very lucky. Trying to cover all our bases, we head into the forested parts of Kazaringa. Another new large creature was just ahead, the sandbar deer. Though common throughout India, Kazaringa is not ideal for them. Sandbar prefer dry forests. With no luck spotting an elephant by the river or in the forested areas, we head to the marshy savanna. Just like that, luck was back with us. Elephants out in the tall grass. Our ranger guide got a report that a jeep was just charged by an elephant. This elephant. As we cautiously approach, we are relieved that it is apparently calmed down. During mating season, males can get quite aggressive as they go into musk, basically our hormonal overload as they seek out females. Because of this seasonal aggression, only a few zoos in the U.S. have male elephants because it requires special containment facilities. Kazaringa has a population of over 1,200 elephants making it one of the leading Asian elephant reserves in the world. India has the largest wild Asian elephant population with 30,000 animals, but their numbers are decreasing due to poaching and habitat loss. Kazaringa is one of the last refuges of this giant of the animal kingdom. We hit the elephant jackpot, spotting several more. With the last of the big three down, we can finish the drive with a smile and a sense of relief. As we exit the park, I spot some movement in the trees. It's ring-necked parakeets. I'm betting they have a nest nearby. Parakeets nest in the holes of older trees. It takes a bit of patience, but it pays off. Mom has returned to the nest. Fittingly, the last animal we see as we leave the park is its signature animal, the rhino. As he walks into the sunset, we can celebrate our good fortune in spotting the big three and many other creatures that call Kazaringa home. Well, we had a little bit of luck on our side and we saw the three really big ones, the elephant, the rhino, and the wild buffalo. We also had a chance to learn a little bit about the British era and tea making. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. I'm Bill Ball, and I'll see you on the next episode of Journeys in India.